Hello, I'm John Hawks. I am an anthropologist uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, my blog is John Hawks Weblog. And I'm Kate Clancy. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois, and I blog at Context and Variation. Okay. Uh, Kate, it's uh, great to be talking to you today. Um, you haven't been on Blogging Heads before, so I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I am, this is now my third year as an assistant professor of anthropology. I'm a biological anthropologist and I study reproductive ecology. What that means is that I look at um, the intersection of our environment and lifestyle and how that impacts reproduction, specifically in women. And um, I also sort of look at inflammation and inflammatory processes and how that impacts the endometrium. My fieldwork is in Poland. Um, in rural Poland at the Mogilica Human Ecology Study Site. And I try to bring a perspective about anthropology and reproductive ecology to my blogging. Um, so I have a blog, Context and Variation, and there I talk about anthropology, I talk about human behavior more generally, um, women in science, and what I like to call the lady business. Um, <laughs> And, and what I mean by that is mostly women's health, but, but again, also some more broad issues around life of science and women in science stuff. Okay, awesome. So you do your field work in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have you been working there? Um, my first, the first time I went there was in 2002, and that was, I guess, my second, that was between my first and second year of grad school. And uh, I went just for a month um, to get the whole field experience. Um, and then went back to actually do my dissertation in 2005, and then I was just back again just this past summer in 2010. Okay, cool. So you've been working with basically a, a you know small small group of people, small village, or um, it's it's varied a little bit. My first time there, I was in a very small village that was very traditional on one side of the mountain. Um, and then on the other side of the mountain, we uh, basically the director of the, of the field site is Dr. Grzyna Yashenska. She's a professor at Jagiellonian University in Kraków, Poland. Okay. And um, she decided to switch over to another village that is a lot larger, um, still very traditional in their farming methods, but with some notable differences. Um, one of them being that they're one of the highest fertility populations in Poland. Um, they, in fact, won an award from the previous pope for being very good Catholics, for making lots and lots of babies. Um, there are women there with 12, even 15 children, and they're giving birth almost every year. Um, so there were a lot of really great reasons to switch over there, but um, there are also people now who work at that field site who sort of look at both sides of the mountain. And it's kind of interesting to see the really different um, behavioral differences in the two populations. Well, that's really interesting. So is it mostly these sorts of cultural issues, tradition that that determines what's going on? Or is it, you know, broader, you know, sort of issues with nutrition uh, and other kinds of things? Um, in terms of the fertility issue, my mm -hmm. suspicion is that it has a, less to do with nutrition, though that could also be part of it, um, and more to do with the fact that uh, the population that we're in now, the village we're in now, um, a lot of the men there work, they're undocumented workers in other parts of Europe and in the U.S. So they make a lot more money going abroad and sending money home than uh, they do by being small farmers. And so okay. it's a really interesting shift in terms of what, it, in terms of, um, what these migratory practices mean for this population and how that shifted the kinds of money they have. Um, it seems to me like there's a lot more variation, just as just qualitatively, but um, that there's a lot more variation in wealth there now based on whether there are people in their family who go abroad or not, or whether they've maintained the more traditional farming practices. Um, but even in those... That, oh, go ahead. Oh, that, I was going to say that's so interesting because it seems sort of to go against the usual economic transition sort of stereotype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been good for them in a lot of ways, uh, having... Yeah. And, and even some jokes about, you know, it's kind of nice having men out of the house for most of the year, <laughs> and then they come home with, for their obligatory month in the summer, and then they're gone again. Uh -huh. um, so there are a lot more, at least in the summers when I'm there, I see a lot more adult women than men. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So your field work, is it, I mean, how would you describe it? Is it like, you know, real traditional anthropological, you know, sort of observation? Um, what kinds of measurements 
do you take? Uh, do you do like blood samples, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so we have done blood samples in the past. We mostly try to do less invasive stuff um, mm -hmm. like urine and saliva when we can, which, you know, for most of the things we study, that's actually pretty easy to do. Um, the, the big thing that we do is uh, we first connect with the clinic. There's a main clinic right down the road from where we tend to stay and talk to the doctor there about our study. Um, then uh, usually someone from the field site, the director of the field site or um, Dr. Yashinska's grad students go and talk to the priest and uh -huh. sort of get our study cleared with the priest. And that way he makes announcements at mass so we seem more legit um, and not just crazy people knocking on random doors. <laughs> right. um, and then with the blessing of the doctor and the priest, we basically go forward. I've, I've put flyers out in the past um, at my 2005 visit, but I don't think it got me a single participant. Um, we wow. basically just went door to door. Um, and sometimes, you know, they would uh, send their dog after us, but most of the time they were very excited to have us come in and interested in what we had to say and excited to work with us. Um, that's, that's really great how you sort of describe that because, you know, a natural question is you're investigating health, mm -hmm. um, you're looking at, you know, really outcomes in, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you're able to study what goes in and then what at the end are the health outcomes. And, and somebody might say, well, what, what's different between this and, you know, anybody studying health in any community population? Sure. And, and you're really illustrating, you know, what the anthropological aspect of this is. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, and it's anthropological in a, in a lot of ways. One, that we get to know the population. We live there um, for, you know, one or two months at a time. Um, actually, there's another really exceptional grad student from University College London, Heidi Colleran, who was there for, I think, almost a year collecting uh, qualitative data and interviews from uh, 22 different villages in the area. So that's one of the broadest studies we've ever done. Um, but, but a lot of us, and like my work, is more longitudinal in terms of the biomarkers and hormones. So um, once we talk to the women and they're interested in participating, um, we usually do some basic anthropometry. That just means, you know, height, weight, uh, body fat, things like that. Get some family history, um, which is really easy in Poland because they have these little books um, called just książki. And within them is usually their, um, a, a lot of their history, their medical history, their length and date of birth, their weight, um, and they usually have them for all of their children. So it's really easy to get basic health information from people. Um, right, yeah. And then we just ask them to collect things for us every day, um, you know, like saliva every day or urine every day, depending on what we're doing. Um, and that way we get often an entire menstrual cycle worth of data, as opposed to what you'd get at a doctor's office or in a clinical study, where they'd measure you one time They'd ask you what your last, when your last period was, and they just sort of guess about whether what they're looking at is follicular or luteal phase, whether it is pathological or not. Um, and here we're getting a sense of an entire cycle. So we're getting just a much better idea of how the human, of how this woman is actually living. Uh huh. Uh huh. I, 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 one of your, one of my favorite posts of yours is the, uh, is the, there's no typical cycle mm -hmm. idea. Um, could you, you know, sort of describe what you mean by that? Sure. Um, so the, the, the post was in the, the Scientific American guest blog one? Yeah. Or, yeah. So um, it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek title, just, I don't have uh -huh. a 28-day menstrual cycle and neither should you. There you go, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, what was really fun about that and, and the reason that I wrote it is that um, I've kind of become, since I was in college, period girl. Um, just women, <laughs> they find out what I do, um, uh -huh. you know, they find out what I'm interested in, and they, they tend, to, I get emails from people I don't even know who say, you know, I'm a friend of a friend, and, uh, you know, my cycle's this long, and I think that's abnormal, and I want to go on hormonal contraceptives, and, um, and so I ended up sort of becoming this, you know, I would say I'm not a doctor, but, uh, you know, here's the actual range of variation, and you fall within that range, and so you might uh -huh. not want to consider yourself to be so horrible. Um, and it, and then I just would get, um, even in my office hours, I would get women sort of tentatively coming up and saying, I have a friend um, who has this problem. And it just became increasingly apparent to me over the last 10 plus years I've been looking at this stuff, um, that women are desperate for good information and are desperate to understand their bodies and are, are eager, really, for good information that respects the natural variation that they're observing in their bodies. So the, this idea that there's a 28-day cycle um, 
I suppose at the extreme end that that's normal for some women in Western populations. Um, but even within Western or industrialized populations like in the US, that's not normal for a lot of women. Um, and it doesn't have to be. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're abnormal. Um, if we understand our bodies in, very, in terms of you know, all of the variability available to us and all the ways in which environment and lifestyle affect us, then you know, it's, not, um, it's not really meaningful to say that there's anything wrong with us or, or that we vary from 28 days. Well, you know, thinking about it from an evolutionary perspective, you know, it, it, the, the idea that there should be a very regular cycle that should be sort of constant among women, uh, you know, in what environment would that ever have happened? It, it just seems like, mm -hmm. you know, the, a natural fertility population to begin with is not going to have sort of endless cycles. It's going mm -hmm. to be, you have maybe a few cycles and then a pregnancy and then lactation um, and, uh, and the idea that it would be highly synchronized, highly constant, it just sort of seems like I can't imagine the environment in which that would have evolved. Exactly. Um, and it didn't. I mean, there's no yeah. way within our forager, <laughs> you know, there's no way in our forager history um, that there were women who did that unless they were infertile. Um, in yeah. fact, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only reason that they would have had those cycles. And even then, they would have had so much energy constraint. Um, just because of the fact that they move around so much more than we do, um, you know, they actually have to go out and get their food. It's not like, you know, I have a chocolate stash in the drawer right next to me right now. Um, they yeah. didn't have that kind of luxury. And yeah. so the major energy constraint they had was that even independent of issues like pregnancy and lactation, there was no way they were having regular cycles that were 28 days. Um, and that was a good thing because why would you allocate all that resource to something unless you were going to use it for reproduction? Well, that's true. I mean, the human body has enormous reserves uh, mm -hmm. that it can draw upon, but you, you want to, you, know, you don't want to draw them down to nothing. You know, mm -hmm. you sort of have to have uh, have an adaptation that that you know lives within the balance that's available to you. Mm -hmm. And almost everything that we can look at anthropometrically, things that you, you know, behavior, all of it is ultimately flexible in the face of the demands the environment puts on you. Exactly, and in women, it's a really um, it's a really careful balance between negotiating the trade-offs of reproduction and survival. And if yeah, women are yeah. have a lot of energy constraint, or they're having pregnancies really close together, they can have what's called maternal depletion, and a lot of things can come out of that: um, increased mortality and morbidity, so they can mm -hmm. have more complications. Mm -hmm. um, they will lose more fat over their lives. They'll lose more hemoglobin over their lives. Um, and, and those have a lot of negative health consequences down the line. So, you know, again, having a body that's sort of adaptable and flexible, especially a female body when you're the one doing all the gestating and lactating, is a really smart thing. Well, one of the things I, you know, I was talking to a, a very prominent geneticist a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were talking about lactase persistence. Um, this is a trait that some human populations have uh, the ones that have it are populations that have a history of dairying, you know, keeping dairy animals for a long time, um, you know, since, since basically domestication 10,000 years ago. And it's otherwise rare, you know, this isn't the wild type for humans, you know, mm -hmm. the, the new version, the lactase persistent version, the kind that digests lactase effectively as adults version, that's a new mutation wherever it occurs. And this geneticist was saying, well, you know, yeah, but how much difference does it make, you know, whether you can digest milk or not? Mm -hmm. and, and I said right away, you know, you might think that, you know, it, the survival situation in which your access to this particular food source is, is rare. Maybe it is. Um, but when we look at, you know, early people who domesticated cattle, domesticated goats, and think about their high fertility environment, and the difference between, you know, when women are lactating, 700 calories a day, um, when they're gestating, it's more than 250. Just think of the availability of resources for you to, to move on to that next pregnancy or to, you know, be able to sustain the one that you have. You know, that's really the tight spot for natural selection in humans is the reproductive process. Mm -hmm. And to think of the way that everything that we do sort of rotates around it is, uh, you know, is a really powerful way of looking at, at our behaviors. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, anytime you have a situation, 
in, um, where you know a, 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 an individual can't necessarily make the best use of their environment and their resources and their food, um, that's going to compromise their reproduction. And so, if that's in our you know at points where that's been in our evolutionary history, that's been really important. And at points where particular populations are depending on particular kinds of foods, it's really important. Um, I'm gluten intolerant, and of course that's led me, being an anthropologist, to be navel gazing, or I guess you could say gut gazing, since I, oh, know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's a very interesting thing to look at, um, to look at the genes that lead to gluten intolerance and the kinds of populations where you see them, because in the populations where they really rely on gluten, um, you don't see it very much because they all died. <laughs> uh, uh, whereas in yeah, the populations I mean, where you weren't really relying on foods that contain gluten, so that would be wheat, wheat barley, rye, and related yeah, cereal yeah, grains, yeah. Um, then you, you know, where they don't rely on it, you see a much higher incidence. Yeah. Are, are you, uh, so is this like an autoimmune sort of intolerance? It seems to be. Um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm not an expert on the immune stuff. You can actually kind of see yeah, The I'm reason I'm asking is I have a, a graduate student now, uh, mm -hmm. Aaron Sams, who's, for his dissertation work, really looking into these autoimmune issues of diet uh, mm -hmm. in agriculturalists versus uh, non-agricultural populations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're really interested in this topic now, um, this yes. interaction between the immune system and the gut, basically, diet. Exactly. It's really, really interesting, and I've, um, I'm starting to get interested in it because, I mean, one, when I was, when I was diagnosed and I discovered my gluten intolerance, it was right before I was trying to get pregnant. Uh -huh. So, of course, I obsessively, I was on PubMed looking up uh -huh. everything I could to see, you know, is there a relationship? Is there anything I need to worry about? And it turns out that there is a pretty strong relationship between undiagnosed celiac disease, which is sort of the end game of gluten. If you discover gluten yeah. intolerance kind of late in the game, you, can, you end up with celiac, which is yeah. the flattening of the villi in the mm -hmm. intestines and, uh, and mm -hmm. problems absorbing nutrients. Yeah. And so um, people who have undiagnosed celiac uh, have lots of spontaneous miscarriages and uh -huh. don't know why. And they keep uh -huh. getting miscarriage after miscarriage. And then studies that have looked at populations of women with many spontaneous miscarriages find a significant portion of them have celiac and they just didn't know it. Right. So um, what that led me to think about, because I said the endometrium, is what exactly is the mechanism here that's causing these miscarriages that would be related right. to something like gluten? And it seems like, at least my first thinking is, and you know, we have to do a lot more studies to, to confirm it, um, is that it has to do with just inflammation. Things like choreodecidual inflammatory syndrome are one of um, the leading causes of miscarriage. Um, mm -hmm. And inflammatory events and infectious events often cause miscarriage or problems with pregnancy. Um, so it seems like you probably have high systemic inflammation if you're consuming gluten, but shouldn't be, you know, because you're having an immune response to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my suspicion is that's somehow what the relationship is. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because we're finding that these things that you would usually have imagined to be really diet controlled, diet mediated, turn out to be immune mediated. Mm -hmm. And that has really unusual effects sometimes. You, you didn't expect the effects that they would have in, in other systems of your body. Um, and, and it's so interesting that you sort of, that you describe that situation because it's just, from a systems standpoint, you know, I study genetics and the way that our genes have changed. And it's much, much easier for us to examine the actual, at the genetic level, the changes that have happened and to understand the forces on them at a genetic level. But when you start to build up to, okay, well, what did this really mean for your body or for an organ system or for, you know, any part of, of your phenotype, it is really difficult in a lot of cases because mm -hmm. these interactions and systems, we just don't have a good understanding of. Exactly. Yeah, I, and that's the thing that's so tricky about all of this work, right, is that, um, you know, we might study one piece that explains 10% of the variation, but there's yeah. still 90% to deal with, you know, um, yeah. and so even when we find these strong, even when we find statistical significance in our studies, we're only looking at one out of many, many different factors that are producing variation in whatever we're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, you know, it's, you know, as I was telling my students the other day, we, we have the power to look for certain things now, mm -hmm. um, much more so than we ever did before. Uh, we have the power to detect differences that are, that are very tiny. Uh, but what we repeatedly find is that 
you know, the differences that we can identify, you know, that we can understand with the methods we have available to us, often just account for a small fraction of what the overall variation is. Right. And uh, in genetics, we call this the missing heritability problem. We know that there's a lot of traits that are really strongly heritable, mm -hmm. um, but we have a lot of trouble finding the genes that actually account for the heritability. And the, the answer to this is that it's, these traits are influenced both by genes that have very small effects, but there are lots and lots of them that are involved and it's hard to find them all. Or they're traits that are affected by maybe a few genes, but the gene variants that cause differences in the traits are very rare, so it's hard for us to find them. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it's not one that we don't have some kind of handle on. Mm -hmm. But it means that there's a whole lot of stuff that's, that's out there waiting to be explained. Yeah, and, exactly. And, you know, everything is this way. <laughs> <laughs> everything interesting, anyway. The, the simple things aren't that way. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, I find it so interesting that, that uh, you describe yourself as Dr. Period because, as you know, I'm Dr. Neanderthal, and, right. and so the people that approach me, uh, usually it's, this is so weird, I used to get this and think, oh, look, this is just very random, but now it happens so often, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you're going to think I'm crazy, but... I think that my husband is a Neanderthal. <laughs> so that's, I, I think I, you know, yours is the first problem like that where I thought, you know, I would really rather have my problem than her problem. <laughs> Whereas I think I probably, I, I think it must be that we really like the fields we're in, because I think I like my problem better than yours, too. Very good. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we both uh, met each other in person a couple weeks ago at uh, Science Online, a conference of bloggers, journalists, uh, people who are pushing science onto the web. Uh, so, Kate, what made you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so many things made me go. I've been, you know, I've been a, a participant, well, a reader and a participant in this community for a really long time, uh -huh. but only had really hung out my own shingle um, in August, um, you know, of my own blog. And right, I've been on sure. Twitter for, you know, I've been on Twitter for a while before that and engaging with the community in that way, but then uh -huh. I decided to also start really blogging in earnest um, and trying to communicate my science to a broader public. Uh, and so when I just last year, I remember watching the Twitter hashtag for Science Online 2010 uh -huh. Uh -huh. and just being intensely jealous. And <laughs> it just seemed like that was where I wanted to be. And right. that was the community that I wanted to know. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, at first, I actually missed the registration. Um, because it was closed in 45 minutes and then that um, is the amazing thing I people don't yeah. understand that they open 300 well, I think about 300 spots for the conference uh, you know because mm -hmm. that's what the place would hold mm -hmm. and uh, and registration was full 45 minutes after it opened mm -hmm. it's amazing yeah I tried it 50 minutes and so I just missed it. Because <laughs> you were watching Twitter, right? I gotta get yeah, on. Exactly. <laughs> well, I had a meeting. I think what happened, I can't, I can't exactly remember, but I think I was in a meeting and I was also trying to submit something. Um, I don't think it was a grant, but I was trying to submit something to someone and, and getting it done. And I thought, well, as soon as I get this done, my reward will be going and registering for Science Online. Okay. Um, and then I go to do it and I get put immediately on the wait list. Uh, but thankfully, the folks in the women in blogging, the women in science blogging panel, wanted me to come and talk because one of the focuses of that panel was writing under your real name. And right, Anne right. Jefferson knew that I had written pseudonymously for a while, um, and you know, and then then obviously switched to my real name recently, and uh -huh. um, was kind of curious about whether I could maybe lend my perspective to that panel a little. So then I was able to go after all, which was of course wonderful. So you experienced it on both sides. You mm -hmm. know, you wrote under a pseudonym for a while, and then you sort of assumed the professional mantle of, okay, I mean, now I'm going to write under my real name. Mm -hmm. um, how did that work out for you? It's been great. Um, uh -huh. I a few people sort of knew me both at you know at both points. 
Um, when I was writing Sonously, I wasn't writing science. It was just an academic, you know, yet another academic blog talking about the life of a graduate student then then faculty member. Um, mm -hmm. And what was great about it is I got to just practice my writing. I mean, I wasn't writing polished science research blogging posts. I was just writing about my life. Yeah. It was a it was an outlet um, where I could write. You know, where I could write non-academically but still be engaged with an academic audience because that was, you know, it was other PhDs who was reading, who were reading me. Sure. Um, so I just feel like I got to know the community and understand the community so much better by doing that first before finally deciding, okay, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to, you know, do the real thing. Uh, well, obviously it's all real, um, but I'm going <laughs> to decide to use it in a way that for I don't know pro professional gain, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people would say it's less real because you do have the potential, at least, of some sort of professional engagement, mm -hmm. uh, which which adds a level of, I don't know, formality, mm -hmm. you know, to it. Exactly. I have to monitor what I'm saying a lot more carefully now. Um, I was already <laughs> careful, but now I'm extra extra careful, uh, and that is hard. Um, that's something that I miss that I can't uh -huh. just dash off something kind of ranty and then feel better um but i Isn't i that like what that it's for <laughs> exactly well, twitter is for that a little bit i get to rant a little bit there um but you know i do appreciate that about the community that um that i think we're all thoughtful about each other that um you know that that at least sometimes we can make efforts to not uh, though I mean, Dr. Isis has actually spoken about this. That's a you know, Dr. Isis is a pseudonym of a um, of a physiology professor, yeah. and um, she's written really, she's spoken really eloquently about this before. Where she's like, regardless of student, you know, if you're writing under a pseudonym or your real name, don't write something that you would want someone to find and know who you are. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that carefulness applies um, either way. But I do think there is a way where I've, I've um, censored myself a bit more now that I use my real name, especially as a, ten as a tenure track professor, as someone who doesn't have tenure yet. Well, I'll tell you, I was very nervous about it before I had tenure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and when I started blogging, I didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was because I was nervous, you know, it, back then. It is just back then. It's been like seven years ago now, but right. way back in the old days, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the people were being denied tenure who were bloggers, mm -hmm. exactly. and uh, and you you just didn't know how your colleagues would respond. You know, they didn't know what it was. They some of them I still don't know what it is, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of them, you know, it, it helped a lot that they sort of found out about it through third parties and sort of understood that, well, it's it's having an impact what he's doing. I, I may not understand it, but it is, you know, people are, are thinking about it and they're, they're having good reactions to it. And so that that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had that experience? <laughs> yeah, um, so far. So, I mean, I've gotten teased some for having mm -hmm. a blog, I'll, <laughs> if I ever dare to say, oh, this is, you know, like yesterday I got, um, uh, you know, I recently got an editor selection at researchblogging.org for a post I wrote on iron deficiency. And so uh -huh. a friend of mine asked me how I was doing. And I was like, oh, well, I just got this editor selection. I feel kind of good about it. And he was like, oh, oh, you did something on your blog. Um, and just sort of, you know, he's like, oh, you should go blog about it. And I don't know. I, I, I can almost guess whose voice this is you're doing. I, I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, there, so there are people who think it's kind of strange or funny. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, that's not my audience. So yeah. my, my yeah. audience is, my audience is, you know, partly um, other academics who are interested in engaging in a broader way across disciplines and across departments. Um, but then I hope also that my audience is, is reaching lay people and, and, you know, like the women I've talked about before, women who are eager yeah. to, to learn something and to understand something different about their bodies. And so um, I actually did recently talk to my dean just this week about my blog. I decided to finally kind of bring it up uh -huh. um, because there were some things going on where it made sense for me to tell him what was going on. And, uh -huh. uh, and he was thrilled. Um, because, you know, it's actually, I think if it's framed in terms of this is how it will bring prestige to your university, this is how it will make, you know, the Department of Anthropology look good, um, 
and this is you know and this is real outreach then I think that they feel very differently about it so I and actually you know the conversation that I had with him I, I think I think it went well in part because I'd gone to your panel at Science Online oh, yeah. um, where uh -huh. you talked about blocking the Academy so I don't know if you want to talk more about that but I actually thought a lot of what you said there was really useful you know my my feeling the administration uh, here at Wisconsin has been a little more you know they're a little more with it than mm -hmm. you know than the than the average faculty member mm -hmm. put it that way you know I, I remember I got sort of a one-line email from my dean early in this process and he's like saw your blog very smart and I just thought okay you know now I've hit it right mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's you know it's always crucial at that level to quantify what you're doing you know mm -hmm. and and they want to know, you know that you're fulfilling you know their mission you know whatever it is and everybody you know every organization has a mission and so if you can sort of show that okay compared to other resources in my field here's what I'm here's the impact that I'm having you know here's how many people are looking at this here's the conversations that I've been able to start here's the community that's engaged with you know what I'm doing um, it, it's that way with any kind of research though you know mm -hmm. when you think about if you step outside of the lab and say okay but how does my research really have an impact on the community that I'm in mm -hmm. um, and for some of us I mean for me as an anthropologist studying you know the distant past of humanity it's very much you know the impact that I have is my ability to bring understanding to you know to what we see around us it's not that you know I'm immediately helping people you know the the, the women with Neanderthal husbands set aside uh, <laughs> you know there's 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 no person that I'm going to you know be able to cure with what I do mm -hmm. but I can add something to you know how we understand ourselves and I can seriously say some kinds of things we know happened and some kinds didn't. And that has an impact on the way that we look for things. You know, it has an impact on the way that we look for genes that impact health, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever research you do, you have to be able to you know, bring that perspective of, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that your work is the most fascinating work ever, but it does have to be, you know, it has this relevance you know it, I'm a part of this community I'm showing the connection between science and you know the way that people live their ordinary you know how they get along in the world um, and blogging I think is a big part of that it's certainly the way that I approach it you know I always think mm -hmm. if I can explain this to you know somebody who is reading me for the first time from across the world then you know, I'm doing something at a very high level. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a really exciting thing about what we do is, um, you know, I recently did a survey of um, of my audience uh -huh. on on my blog. Um, though it was right before my blog traffic exploded, so it might be <laughs> I don't know how it's, but it's I think it's still fairly accurate. And what was interesting is, you know, a healthy third of my readers have PhDs. Uh -huh. So you know, I'm talking, and and most of them, I think, are anthropology PhDs. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm talking to a lot of people within my field. I'm communicating, you know. So I'm, I think, I'm communicating across um, subfields of anthropology in a meaningful way. If if some of the readers I know of are an indication, um, but then there were a lot of interested lay people, and there were people from all over the world. And um, I do think that that has a lot of meaning when we can translate our work to these different to all of these different people. Um, and I also think it does bring prestige to the universities we work at. I, I think like one of the things that um, is a priority in my university right now is providing better research experiences for undergraduates. That, oh, yeah. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, we're an R1 institution. We mm -hmm. should be, you know, we should be having these fantastic research opportunities because we have these fantastic research faculty. Yeah. Um, and so, and yet that's something that, you know, I think we still need some work to do better, to do a better job with. And um, I think, by putting some of my perspective out there, one, students get a sense of, is this someone I'd want to work with or not? I've actually gotten students um, in my lab because of my online presence, um, both in terms of grad student applicants and, uh, you know, and just students within the University of Illinois. Uh -huh. And um, I think I've shown more depth to the students that I'm teaching 
I teach a lot of non-majors. Um, pretty much everyone I teach is not an anthropology major. And yeah. so when I require that they say, read my blog, and um, they get extra credit for commenting on it, um, mm -hmm. then they end up getting a, a, just a deeper experience with the material than they would have otherwise. And so it's a way of, it's, it's kind of a way of easing them very gently into this idea that, hey, maybe you could do this too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that aspect of it is so important. And you mentioned your traffic exploded. So I, I can only imagine that after your post a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, sort of the summary of the Women in Science panel, you know, I, I, I just feel like that must have really been, you know, a lot of people, you got a lot of attention out of this. I did. Yeah. I'm, I'm still, not, <laughs> still not totally sure what it was about the way I wrote it. Um, I sort of had a lot of, you know, back channel conversations with, pe with people uh -huh. on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. as the traffic was exploding and as everyone was retweeting it. And um, what I tried to do, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how I wanted to talk about it because I, w I wanted to have the effect that I, I did luckily end up having. And um, <laughs> Sometimes I, it does work out. <laughs> I know, it's nice when it does. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things I decided to do is, you know, I have, as any, uh, any young woman, does we all tend to accumulate random sexist stories of things that have happened to us yeah. um, and I was trying to think of how I could present one in a way that showed sort of gender schemas in a in a more broad subtle way as opposed mm -hmm. to some of the obvious more obvious stuff that I've been confronted with mm -hmm. um, as a as a way to sort of gently ease people into the fact that okay now I'm gonna be talking about sexism get ready. Um, and so yeah. I think the fact that I opened with kind of a gentle story, um, you know, about a, a colleague who sort of made a comment on my personal appearance in a way that was kind of inappropriate, um, but I didn't pass judgment. I sort of talked about what, you know, what happened in that moment. Um, I think that was meaningful. And then I think the fact that I just happened to have a number of really wonderful sort of small, like small group conversations with women leading up to the panel and I shared those experiences, um, I think it made it so that readers who were going to be uncomfortable with the content because it's uncomfortable to have privilege and then to have that sort of revealed to you, yeah. um, I think they were going to take it a little bit better than if it was just me saying, here are all of the bad things. You know, I was able to say, okay, these are anecdata, but mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's from probably 15 to 20 min min women over the course of 48 hours. Um, and here are the themes that I saw again and again. It was like it was like getting yeah. to run my own set of focus groups on this question. Um, so I think those I, I, I'd like to think that those are two of the things that ended up making it so that people were really thoughtful. And the fact that I sort of tried to keep an even tone meant that the comment thread was just I mean the comment thread is in many ways better than the post. I mean people were just amazing there and nobody fed the trolls. You know there were a few people who got <laughs> on there and were rude. And we just kind of ignored them and kept having our conversation and it was really amazing. <laughs> So what aspects of, I mean, American culture is a sexist culture in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, what aspects of it do you think are especially, you know, sort of, I don't know, hazardous pitfalls uh, for women who are entering science? Um, I think there are, well... I don't know all of them. <laughs> no, there's there's um, no accounting for all of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess there are a couple of things that I'm noticing right now that mm -hmm. that trouble me, or that I don't even know if trouble me is exactly the right thing, but I haven't totally decided how I feel about it. Uh -huh. um, there's a way where sex and the female body is used to sell a lot of stuff. Oh, Pretty yeah. much anything can be sold by putting a woman in a bikini in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, both in terms of making it uh, more palatable for men and women to want to buy the object. Um, uh, because women will look at it and say, well, that's the body type I want. And men will look at it and say, well, that's the person I want. Sure. Um, yeah. And so that, I think just that idea, the fact that the female body is just sexualized at all times in our mm -hmm. culture, um, that it's like you cannot escape the fact that you are going to be a sexualized person at all times, or that you're going to be viewed as sexualized at all times. It doesn't matter if you're at the gym, if you're reading a book, if you're pipetting, uh, you know, your Eliza assay or what, um, you're going to be viewed as sexual. And I, and I think that that's, that's something that I, that I think has just really broad impacts on women. Um, I think the other is just that from a very, very young age, we describe women and men using different terms. Uh, we value things that men do. 
Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine who gave a talk um, at a STEM initiative for women at Harvard. She gave a talk wow. yesterday, um, Debbie Chatra. She's at uh, Olin. Um, it's an engineering uh, college in Boston or near Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about this idea of gender schemas that um, she was talking about studies where when you take two, when you take a set of CVs and what you do is in this study, what they did is they took, um, they had uh, a CV that was heavier on experience and a set of CVs that were heavier on, um, on credentials. And then they okay. put, you know, male names and female names on them. And uh, when the male name was on the CV that had more experience, people who looked at the CV said experience was more important when determining a job candidate. Mm -hmm. When the male name was on the CV for, um, for credentials, the people who were then surveyed said credentials were more important in determining a worthy right. job candidate. Right. So there are just these ways where you know, we're more willing to accept that what a man is doing is good. We're more willing to... Um, I don't know, to just believe the word of a man over the word of a woman's uh, and, and just sort of trust their information. And I think that that's, that's, you know, when you're trying to publish, you know, when you're using the scientific method, you're trying to respect the process of science, you're trying to report your results as honestly as possible. But there is, of course, human bias in the kinds of questions you ask and the kind of conclusions um, in who wants to publish your stuff. Those kinds of things are all going to be important. Yeah, I, you know, the thing, the thing that it just strikes me as, you know, the science blogging community, which is a relatively small community, and I, a lot of people know each other fairly well, there is, uh, nevertheless, a real discrepancy between, you know, who gets linked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and just at that level, there is a real pronounced difference in terms of sex of the writer in mm -hmm. terms of you know whether they get a lot of links you know what what network is linking to them and it's not i mean this is a community in which it's not about what you write so much you know mm -hmm. people sort of have their things that they write about and if you write something that's interesting you know, it's going to get linked but nevertheless there is this sort of bias and right to know that it happens within a community that is otherwise, I think, you know, pretty aware of diversity Absolutely. issues. You know, you know that within science, you know, of course, me as a paleoanthropologist, I say anthropology, you know, the scientific side of it, maybe we'll mm -hmm. talk about this. <laughs> right. <laughs> anthropology is a science in which uh, women have a really good representation. You know, this is, you know, we have a lot of really successful female anthropologists and, you know, in terms of people entering the field, uh, you know, it's more men, more women than men, right. um, you know, but nevertheless, there are parts of anthropology, paleoanthropology is one of them, where they're, you know, heavily male biased, where there's this sort of, you know, there, there are, you know, I have obnoxious stories about things that... Mm -hmm old men in paleoanthropology have done to young women and it's just you know I, I, I look at it and I think how could you live this way you know but it's a uh, that's the reality of science right. you know, there it's a hierarchical network it's got people who have power it's got people in pursuit of power and like any other situation in life you know, it, it, it you know, sex differences have this impact on the way things work out. Right. Um, and I think that, I mean, and, and I think one of the things you were saying about, um, about you know, the science online community, mm -hmm. I think about how the fact that we're, you know, we're actually a pretty cool bunch. We don't, we don't want to oppress anybody. <laughs> we all try, you know, we try to be thoughtful and we still right. see that bias. Um, you know, there's a way where I, I would apply that to most of my experiences in anthropology as well. Mm -hmm. And the issue though is, People simply have to be reminded, and there was a way yeah. in which our panel and uh, the posts that came out of it, like my post, but then the many, many ones that happened after mine as well, mm -hmm. where um, we were providing a reminder. And you know, when I first when I first came to the University of Illinois, um, I decided to go to an LGBT ally training, and mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know, I try not to be heteronormative, and I try not, you know, and I'd like to think I'm not homophobic. And mm -hmm. but there was a way where that three-hour training. Um, did more to change my awareness of the ways in which, um, you know, people of different sex sexualities are systematically oppressed, the ways in which I can unconsciously, without meaningful, without meaning to, exclude them in the way I use my language, um, 
you know, that I will never understand that moment of what it would be like to come out. Um, those, that, that experience of that ally training fundamentally changed the way that I talk in lecture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's what these kinds of panels and these kinds of blog posts can do for our community and, and I'd like to think for the broader anthropological and scientific community is it's, you know, no one wants to be, I mean, I guess there are some jerks out there who revel in being sexist or racist, but um, most of us really don't we'll, want to We'll be. hear from them in the comments, no doubt. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> but the vast majority of people are going through life thinking they're doing a pretty good job, trying not to be exclusionary, and are really uncomfortable if you point out behavior that might be, um, that might ultimately be racist or sexist. And so it's just a matter of figuring out how to communicate that in a way that people can hear it so that they can change their behavior themselves. Um, well, I think so, know. yeah. I think talking from experience is one of the most powerful ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that scientific literature is so unsuited for. Right. You know, it, it's, it's so formal and stilted. And okay, you could do a systematic study of some kinds of things related to it, but still you would be really constrained. Um, you know, we need more narratives. We need exactly. more people telling their stories. Mm -hmm. uh, in science, you know, to show the human aspect of it. Yeah, and that's why there are so many, that's why I think actually there's such a high value to both pseudonymous and real name blogging mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. sometimes there are things, even when you still have to protect what you're saying a little bit as a pseudonymous blogger, there are still things that I think you can say as a pseudonymous blogger that are different. Um, and, yeah. and, and sometimes those, those stories are intensely important for us to hear. One of the things that, um, one of the posts that came off of the one I wrote was a woman who wrote about how she cannot support the women's science blogging revolution because she's afraid of men. Mm. And she wrote about her personal mm. experience and why that, it was, yeah, that, yeah it, and she yeah. was just, and how, how her life experience led to her to be the kind of person who was terrified of men and how that meant that she felt bad about the fact that she couldn't participate or be more of an advocate within this community. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a really, really important thing that people had to hear is that, is, is that fear that so many women walk around with and live their whole lives with. I think all of us live with some amount of fear. Um, and that's just a reality. But um, to have your it written success, about so eloquently. I know. Your success in science is mostly who you know and how yes. you interact with them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, you might... People might imagine that, oh, well, you do good work, you know, you go into the lab, you do good work, and things will come out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it rarely works that way. Right. Um, and, and even then, there's a large element of chance to it. You know, I've gotten a lot of attention for things that were actually very easy. <laughs> and I've, I've done some things that are very hard that nobody ever recognized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's that exactly. way with anything. But, mm -hmm. you know, to, to persist, to have a career in it. To support a group of people that depend on you, that depends on your ability to, you know, do the social thing, mm -hmm. and uh, and the barriers that are in the way for many of us doing the social things, you know, those barriers impede our progress. They impede science. Yeah, Kathy Weston just wrote about this too. Actually, about I, it's, how it's a fascinating piece. Yeah, yeah, that was really it was devastating in a lot of ways, but also yeah. really important. I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a narrative of somebody who, who left science, uh, mm -hmm. who is now engaged as a science writer freelance, um, but uh, but describes, you know, the in, the, in her case, the, the sort of the inability to do the things that got the treadmill, you know, that kept the treadmill going. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, you know, it wears on you. It really does. It's I I'm, I feel so fortunate in, in what I do that you know that, that the questions that I engage with are just really deeply you know hold my attention keep me going you know those mysteries because there are times when you just think yeah you know like what, is this really worth it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. but it is it is worth <laughs> it if you're pursuing something that you really really love exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, so last fall, I'll, I'll change the topic to the sure. AAA fail. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> last fall, anthropology declared itself no longer science. Is that, <laughs> is that fair? <laughs> that's certainly how it felt to a lot of us. I, I don't think, you know, that's not precisely what happened, but 
there is an American Anthropological Association, and they mm -hmm. have uh, you know planning documents, and they're revising their planning, and they. Uh, in the course of this, uh, in, in what they describe, uh, the executive board describes as a way to be more inclusive of the non-scientific approaches in anthropology, uh, cultural anthropologists in particular, um, they, they excised, uh, it used to be the planning document was anthropology is the science of understanding humanity and it, it's the scientific aspects and so on. So they, they strategically took out all of the references to science mm -hmm. um, and uh, and left none of them so that mm -hmm. upset people right uh, yeah it deeply upset me I mean I was like how could you be so stupid um, but so you uh, participated in a letter on this uh, mm -hmm. the, the bloggers letter now, how did that come about um, well so Julian Rutherford who's mm -hmm. a faculty member, assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, she studies placental ecology, and I study the endometrium, and so placentas and endometria get along very nicely, as you might expect, and so so do Julianne and I. Um, we've been friends for years, and um, she has a blog, AAPA, so that's American Association of Physical Anthropology, yep. aapabandit.blogspot.com, mm -hmm. that she uses, um, not in the same way that, say, I use my blog, where I do, say, research-oriented posts, but actually in some ways as a social center for physical anthropologists. Mm -hmm. She highlights different, um, you know, different articles that are coming up that, inter that are interesting. She highlights junior faculty. She talks about the goings-on in the field. And she wrote a lot about this when it first mm -hmm. happened, um, both her own perceptions and she would sort of uh, bring in the perceptions of others. Um, and Daniel Lend at Neuroanthropology, he's at, um, mm -hmm. in the PLOS blogs, he also similarly was sort of really keeping on top of things, um, spreading the work uh, and the online writing of a lot of anthropologists very far and wide. I learned of a lot of people I didn't even realize were head blogs. Um, yeah. It was really neat. I, I just <laughs> I met so many anthropology bloggers as a result of this process. And the three of us were, um, were talking online, you know, just sort of emailing about all of it, about how we were sort of, we were upset by the fact that when they finally did respond, um, they talked about the polarizing effects of some of the online conversations and they were referencing and they were specifically referencing non-anthropologists like the New York Times coverage by Nicholas Wade um, mm -hmm. and other folks mm -hmm. and so they completely ignored the fact that probably 20 30 posts maybe more had been written about AAA fail by anthropologists we, we um, keep saying AAA fail because that's the Twitter hashtag for this. Exactly. It is, it's, it's got a perfect ring to it to me. <laughs> yeah. And, and also the other thing I'll say is I think, um, I think some of the people who aren't as familiar with the online science community don't realize what the term fail means and yeah. Yeah. Uh, take it personally. Um, but fail is a, is a much more tongue-in-cheek, lighthearted term um, yeah. than I think people realize. And so AAA fail is meant to be a little funny. It's not meant to be... Um, doom and gloom like exactly yeah like that, yeah so. I haven't been a member of the AAA for for several years and I, I think that many of us who are you know biological anthropologists archaeologists you know people who consider themselves to be scientists um, are, have sort of you know fallen away become disillusioned by that particular you know aspect of of you know it, it doesn't represent anthropology it represents uh, an aspect of anthropology Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, one it time, just... yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Um, the one time I went was in 2007 um, because mm -hmm. I was invited to be on a panel. Mm -hmm. um, Pablo Nepomnashi and Virginia Vitsum were running one, oh, yeah. and it was really it was a great panel. It was really fun to be part of it. Uh -huh. um, but you know, I got this enormous book of you know the the program because it's so much bigger than the AAPAs, the kind of the the the, the um, conference that you and I might be more likely to go to. Yeah. And, uh, and I was just completely overwhelmed by titles that had no meaning for me. And I'm yeah. sure they were really important and interesting and had meaning for lots and lots of other people, but I couldn't I find a single other session to yeah. attend that I thought would be useful <laughs> for me. I have, to, I have to be a skeptic. I'm going to say, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't interest me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It just it was just a hard you know, and so I remember just being kind of frustrated by being there because I was like, I'm here for my one panel. I'm mm -hmm. not going to see anybody I know because it's so big mm -hmm. that I you know I can sit in that lobby for hours and not see a single person I recognize, even old grad school friends. Yeah. Um, and so it just kind of 
it was kind of a disheartening experience. And so I just thought, well, and then, and then, you know, since AAA fail, a lot of people have brought up even stronger concerns where mm -hmm. um, bioanthro panels are run at the same time. So oh, right, yeah. the few biological yeah. pathologists that are there can't get, yeah. you know, they have to run back and forth. Um, so some of the, the planning that goes into maybe welcoming all the different kinds of anthropologists just needs to be more thoughtful in the future. And, and what I'd like to think is that some of the things we've done have maybe highlighted some of those sort of simmering frustrations. Well, you know, my agenda is, is you know, strengthening science, mm -hmm. making it clear that the understanding of human origins is, is serious, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a research topic that has a serious empirical basis. Mm -hmm. The evidence for our evolution is evidence that I have held in my hands. Um, and to, it just, it, it's, it works against everything that I think we should be doing in, in society to, uh, to sort of cast that away carelessly and say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we didn't really think about that. Uh, right. It just ah, it just rubs me the wrong way, um, mm -hmm. but that's that's me. I, I was really, you know, a lot of people encouraged me to write more about it, and I just thought, you know, this is sort of it's difficult to write about. Um, but I did have students contact me and say, should we rethink our plans to to do this? You know, because if if really you're in a field that is you know anti science. Um, then you know that's not the field that I want to be associated with, right? And you know it's it's the sort of thing where it it would have been so easy to do it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I do. Know, so. I mean, I do think it was. I, I I am fairly certain that it was unintentional, or that what they yeah. thought what they yeah. thought they were doing was actually to make things more welcoming. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. the that wasn't what happened. But I do think that's what they thought. And yeah. I think part of that comes from, at least what I read of some people who are who were supportive of the changes, um, is this idea that science is just just a way of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that troubles me in the same way that you've talked about the importance of understanding evolution and, and evolutionary theory in, in humans. Mm -hmm. um, thinking that science is just a way of knowing um, and, and therefore adding legitimacy to certain ways of knowing that maybe aren't very good or are potentially very dangerous. That's well, why I, I imagine, nervous. you know, even at a, you know, you can think about the broad political strokes level of, mm -hmm. you know, do we accept science? Do we not accept science? But if we go to the really, I think, much more personal level, you know, think about your field work mm -hmm. and you're going somewhere where there are things that you're observing and you want to understand them and you're doing it with a scientific frame. Um, and the, 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 obviously people who are experiencing them have their own perception of them, their own experience of them. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's quite you know, valid to, to say that well, there are different ways of, of sort of describing this, you know, and the people who are living it have their own understanding of it. Um, but the scientific way of understanding it is, is sort of special in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's the way that, you know, gets us to the machinery of how it's put together. Exactly. It's sort of the foundational material upon which we can maybe rest some of these other ways of knowing or understanding things. Um, yeah. An example yeah. to me is just recently, so you've probably heard the term uh, post-abortion stress syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's yeah. an anti, it's sort of a creation of the anti-choice movement that mm -hmm. there is, that you are more at risk for depression and stress syndromes, like basically PTSD after mm -hmm. having an abortion. Um, this, it wasn't scientific in basis. It was a way of knowing manufactured by anti-choice people who were trying to think of ways to scare women from having abortions. Right. Um, right. But a paper just came out, a mm -hmm. scientific paper, mm -hmm. <laughs> that demonstrated that um, there is actually no difference in the risk of getting depression before um, after an abortion compared to before in the same mm -hmm. group of women. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did is they also looked at women before and after having a baby. And of course, the risk of depression after having a baby is much higher because we know that having a baby actually does greatly increase your risk for depression. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying I have a baby. I'm not saying, you know, therefore we shouldn't, we shouldn't be having them. I'm just no, saying tell we me. need to. I, ha I, I haven't had any, but, but we've, we've raised four and uh, <laughs> depression is never far from my mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just, a, there's just a way where I think, you know, the fact that, um, that they would manufacture this medical claim 
Um, but then science was able, to, you know, then, then a scientific study was able to demonstrate that it's not a legitimate claim. Just shows how important these kinds of things are for for our ways of knowing and for politics and for how we understand the female body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, you can. I can understand that there are different ways to put together the world, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and I'm. You know, I put together the world in different ways on different days. <laughs> and being a scientist involves such a commitment, I think, to skepticism that that I'm really unwilling to, to, to go to the step to say, oh, science says this, and so we must do it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I can't do that. I, I would say that, well, look, you know, everything that deserves us considering and and giving you know if we're going to promote a course of action that we want people to follow we need to understand it 10 times better you know you, almost in every case mm -hmm. and i just feel like if if we abandon our commitment to saying that we're going to do everything that we possibly can to understand this and to and to get it right Right. Before we say, "Hey, you should do this," mm -hmm. you know, that that to me is the commitment of science. Right. And that almost uh, brings us full circle, I think, to why blogging and science blogging is so important, um, <laughs> which is kind of neat. Just because I do feel like, you know, I have very strong opinions about, um, uh, you know, about the way in which hormonal contraceptives are prescribed in this country, about the ways in which women are taught about their bodies. Yeah. Um, but there's no way, at least for me personally, that I could just be a, that I could be a, a science writer that just wrote about those things without mm -hmm. the fact that I'm also doing research on it, mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. the constant inquiry and thinking and statistical analysis and scientific writing that I have to do in order to continue doing the research part of my job. Um, I don't think that I would have there would be as much richness to my understanding of what I'm able to communicate to to the public in my blogging. I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, the thing is that, you know, as, as somebody who's writing for a more public forum, um, the, what you bring to it is your own unique story. And the story that we have, you know, the story that we have that's, uh, that other people don't, is we do know something about, you know, what happens when you look at things. <laughs> it, it, and it, in your research, it's, you know, oh, what happens when I go into these communities and see what's going on? In my research, it's what happens if we if we put together these genes in another way. You know, how likely is it that we'll see that? Uh, right. What did we have before? You know, what do people say? And there's a history to this too. You know, what do people think about this in 1943? Um, mm -hmm. Which a lot of times is the same thing that they think about it now. <laughs> or, or the arguments have never been settled, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we've gone through an hour. Um, yeah, wow. And we have covered a lot of topics. I think that this has just been an amazing conversation because my, my feeling is that there are so many interesting things that are going on right now, uh, mm -hmm. especially in our field, you know, is just a, a huge richness of, of information that we're getting from sources that weren't available to us before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, there's a temptation to, to sort of to say, oh, wow, you know, look at the world around us. It's wonderful. And, and not think, you know, and how do we get our hands extended down to bring other people to where, you know, they can see what we're seeing. And those aspects of science, you know, talking about it, getting it out there, bringing up, you know, colleagues, mentoring them, negotiating those sort of social issues that, govern your career. I mean, I, I just think those things are so important for us to, to you know, to talk about. Uh, so I'm so glad that I could do it with you. <laughs> yeah, this has been a real pleasure. I don't, it almost sounds like there might be a collaboration in the works of, uh, after hearing about the autoimmune stuff that you do. So oh, it's, it's, you know, I got to learn is, even I, more about the stuff We are so excited about this stuff. I tell you, Aaron is going to be embarrassed that I talked about it because <laughs> he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, we already know there's going to be some some cool stuff in this and and hopefully you know we'll get lucky and we'll discover something really interesting about it yeah yeah i'm very excited for you <laughs> it sounds really cool okay well thanks kate thank you very much